Welcome, welcome. I'm going to give a few seconds to let any remaining people enter into our room and be merged. We are thrilled that you are all here. We'll be starting our remarks in 10 or 15 seconds. I see that our, our numbers are tickling up with some consistency. So I'm just gonna give it another second or two. Uh, again, to all that are here, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Andrew Zimmern. Uh, today, we're gonna be talking about ways to add more plant paste and vegetarian options to your menus. In particular, we're gonna be hearing some from some amazing people today. Uh, Amanda Cohn of Dirt Candy, Chef Nina Curtis of Plantish and Company, and Hannah Lopez from the Plant-Based Foods Association. Uh, but first, uh, we're going to be hearing from Laura Carroll uh, from the White House. Uh, President Biden recently hosted a historic White House conference on hunger, nutrition, and health, which included the release of an unprecedented national strategy uh, thanks to the advocacy of all of you uh, and so many who are not able to be with us today, President Biden included a commitment to increase the availability of plant-based or vegetarian entree options in federal facilities in the official White House strategy paper. The Environmental Working Group, the James Beard Foundation, the Plant-Based Foods Association, the Independent Restaurant Coalition, and yes, even myself, have made a commitment to encourage chefs and restaurant owners and operators to make a plant-based or vegetarian option available on all of our menus as well. Now, there are many reasons to make plant-based and vegetarian meals available. Um, I have my own personal journey here. People are often shocked uh, when I'm talking about this subject that's very near and dear to me uh, as a fairly well-known carnivore. But uh, it, over the last 10 years, I reduced uh, the uh, uh, meat and poultry intake uh, in my own home by about 75%. Um, I'm more of a flexi pescatarian, uh, but I am vegetarian before dinner six days a week. Um, I am 61 years old. And the reason why I, I behave like a 13 year old and look like I'm 55 is simply because uh, I have taken a different approach to eating. Um, now, I, I think we all know that there are many health benefits that come with increasing our consumption of vegetables and consumers are seeking these when they dine away from home. And we all know that getting more of our protein from plants is one of the ways we can all reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. But emphasizing a plant-based or majority plant-based diet does so much more for global sustainability, uh, for economic development, for uh, solving our immigration problems, and it goes on and on and on. Uh, so before we turn to our experts, Amanda, Nina, and Hannah, I wanted to invite uh, Laura from the White House uh, to offer her thoughts. Laura? Hi, uh, thank you all so much. My name is Laura Carroll. I am a policy advisor at the Domestic Policy Council and one of the co-leads for the White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health. And thank you for having me here today. Uh, as many of you may know, just over a month ago, the President Biden hosted the first White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health in over 50 years. We were joined in person and online by Americans from all walks of life and sectors of society, from federal, state, and local government leaders to agricultural producers and healthcare providers to people with lived experience with hunger and diet-related diseases. As part of the conference, the president set at an ambitious but achievable goal to end hunger and reduce diet-related diseases by 2030. And as was mentioned, we also released a national strategy on hunger, nutrition, and health at the same time, creating a roadmap for actions the federal government will take administratively, as well as proposals that Congress can enact, and a call to action across society to bring about the changes necessary to meet our goals. The Biden-Harris administration is fully committed to implementing the actions that we laid out. And that means creating a pathway to free healthy school meals for all, 
thereby laying a healthy foundation for our nation's children. It entails expanding food as medicine interventions across federal health care systems to help focus on prevention and not just treatment. Our roadmap also calls for updating what it means when a food's healthy and establishing a front of pack label scheme for food packages to quickly and easily communicate nutrition information to everyone. And it involves implementing the federal food service guidelines across all federal facilities and expanding incentives for fruits and vegetables and snacks, both of which will enable healthier choices. Additionally, it includes bolstering funding for nutrition research to ensure we have sound science to inform effective policies. We know that this can't be achieved overnight, nor can we do this alone. Hunger and diet related diseases touch every one of us, so every one of us should be part of the solution. Many of you already stepped up and made commitments in support of the White House Conference, so thank you for that. And as chefs, you play a crit critical role in helping make our national strategy a success including helping schools develop delicious and nutritious meals kids love, or partnering with programs that teach people the skills they need to cook healthy meals at home, and much more. We know that hunger and diet-related diseases are largely preventable and that we have a long road to travel, but together we have the policies, the ideas, and the commitment to reduce diet-related diseases and eliminate hunger in our country if we prioritize them. So I hope after today's webinar, you leave it even more motivated to take meaningful action. And we look forward to working with all of you in the months and years ahead. Oh, Andrew, you're muted. I knew that was gonna happen. I just said the smartest thing and I can't remember it now. Thank you, Laura. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, some very special people. Uh, Amanda Cohen is the chef and owner of Dirt Candy, the first vegetable-focused restaurant in the city, and is a pioneer of the vegetable forward movement. Dirt Candy was the first vegetarian restaurant in 17 years to receive two stars from the New York Times, was recognized by the Michelin Guide five years in a row, and has won awards from Gourmet, The Village Voice, and many, many others. Amanda was the first vegetarian chef to compete on Iron Chef America, and her, her comic book cookbook, Dirt Candy, a cookbook, is the first graphic novel cookbook to be published in North America. It's currently in its seventh printing. Nina Curtis is the director and executive chef of Plantish and Company Culinary Arts. She is on a mission to feed people food to live for, not to die for. She is passionate about teaching others how to liberate themselves through food and share the abundance of options one can enjoy by adopting a plant-based lifestyle. Chef Curtis has been an avid proponent of a plant-based lifestyle for over 20 years. Her food and beverage background includes working with the Marriott Group, Hilton Hotels, Baxter's, Manhattan Beach, the El Caballo, Oakland, Pure Food and Wine in New York, and the Springs Restaurant and Wine Bar in Los Angeles. In 2019, she was the grand prize winner of the Healthcare Culinary Contest sponsored by Healthcare Without Harm. In 2020, she won the Food Literacy Center Veggie of the Year Chef Champion Contest. In 2021, she won the Food Literacy Center Veggie of the Year People's Choice Award. He said, turning the page. I am clearly missing something here. Scott, uh, can you uh, introduce Hannah's CV? Maybe, a... ask, maybe we could ask Hannah to introduce herself. Hannah. I can. That's okay. Save the best for last. So my name is Hannah Lopez. I am the Director of Food Service on the Marketplace Development Team here at the Plant-Based Foods Association. I have been in hospitality for nearly all of my life. And I'm just so excited to be a part of uh, this group today and really advocate for uh, healthier food options here in the food service industry. Uh, the Plant-Based Food Association, uh, we are a trade organization supporting plant-based food companies with over 350 members strong, representing a diverse roster of plant-based food companies, ingredient suppliers, investors, and key stakeholders in the plant-based industry. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and for saving me from my missing pages. 
Uh, so what's going to happen now is we're going to hear from uh, Amanda and Nina and Hannah, and then we are going to field your questions, uh, audience, and we promise to get you uh, out of here in a timely fashion. So without further ado, uh, the one and only Amanda Cohn. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction. Um, I'd also like to add that I am an undefeated Iron Chef in Canada as a vegetarian Iron Chef. So you really can go far with vegetarianism these days. Um, so you all might know, vegetables get a pretty bad rap. Uh, we've been serving them exclusively at Dirt Candy since 2008. And when you say vegetarian entree, people all too often picture a poorly prepared grilled portobello. They don't imagine something delicious landing on their plates. But vegetarian cooking doesn't have to be bland and boring, and it doesn't have to be health food, and it doesn't have to just be meat substitutes. If you want to get people to eat more vegetables, serve really good food and make sure it's delicious and fun. You don't have to source the most exclusive organic vegetables or a special heirloom product that only one farmer in the state grows. You can make everyday ingredients like carrots and onions and broccoli, cauliflower, root vegetables and beets really, really extraordinary. They are the most versatile, exciting and dynamic of all the ingredients that I can play with in my kitchen. And they deserve to be the star of the plate. They don't need to play second fiddle. But let's be honest a little. Most vegetables, they're not like people's favorite things. Nobody like wakes up in the morning and goes, ah, oh, I'm really craving a rutabaga. <laughs> but that's our fault because we haven't made them craveable. America's favorite vegetables by a wide margin are tomatoes and potatoes. I always find this fascinating. They make up 51% of the vegetables consumed in the United States. That's not so bad until you realize that almost all of those potatoes are used either to make french fries or potato chips. And almost all of those tomatoes are used to either make ketchup or pizza sauce or spaghetti sauce. I run a vegetable restaurant. It's not vegan and it's not vegetarian because both of those imply some kind of political or health goal. And while there's nothing wrong with that, I'll be honest, what I really care about is the food on the plate. I care about most of your health, but not necessarily trying to deal with it at the night at the restaurant. I run a restaurant devoted to vegetables because no one else does. When I opened Dirt Candy, I looked around and I was like, oh my gosh, there's like thousands of chicken restaurants and meat restaurants and fish restaurants, but there seriously wasn't one restaurant in New York City, I would go far, so far as to say anywhere in North America that was solely devoted to vegetables. I think of my kitchen as a lab dedicated to pushing vegetables further, seeing what we can do with them. In a recent poll, Three out of four Americans said that the primary reason they eat vegetables was to stay healthy. We've turned them into a medicine cabinet. And that's been going on since we were kids. Eat your broccoli, it's good for you. Eat some salad before you get dessert. Eat your carrots, it'll give you good eyesight. And because of that, most people think of vegetables as a punishment. They think of them as boring. But that's because we cook them in boring ways. We cook them over and over again in the same way and then blame them for being boring. Roasted Brussels sprouts, stir fried broccoli, raw celery with peanut butter on it, whatever one does with celery. And vegetarian cooking doesn't have to be boring. But for years, vegetarian food has been about saying no to meat rather than saying yes to vegetables. And that is so important. Yes, vegetables, no meat. Vegetarian restaurants have done great things for animal rights and they've done great things for people living the vegetarian lifestyle, but they haven't done so great for food. So many of the culinary innovations of the last 40 years has come out of vegetarian cuisine, farm to table, the organic movement, fusion cuisine. But vegetarian food hasn't been recognized of having had anything to do with that. And so many of those started with them. If we want people to eat more vegetables, we have to make vegetables more fun. People will eat more vegetables when they crave them, the same way we crave fried chicken or barbecue or a ham sandwich. And that's what we do at Dirt Candy. On the one hand, it looks like I'm sort of making a really expensive tasting menu for the elite in Manhattan. But on the other hand, what I'm really doing is using those diners to subsidize my experiments with vegetables as a focus group. And I can see that people like eating this food. 
I've already spun off a veggie burger I developed based on a 2000 year old Chinese recipe to a burger plate. And there are dishes people keep asking me to do more with like our portobello mousse and our broccoli hot dogs and our carrot slider. If I hadn't tried it, I'd never realized that chocolate and onion go great together, or that mustard greens make the most delicious sorbet. When fancy chefs try to embrace vegetables, they often do more harm than good because they perpetuate this notion that for vegetables to taste good, they have to come from some organic heirloom farm hidden in a valley behind a mountain. You can only pick the vegetable at like midnight on every third Tuesday. When people ask me where my vegetables come from at Dirt Candy, I tell them the same place every chef in Manhattan gets them in a box, off a truck. The cult of the magical farm somewhere upstate where all the best produce well has done little to increase the taste of our meal and a lot to make everyone insecure about the vegetables they get at the grocery store. If you want people to eat more vegetables, you have to show them that they can be fun and you have to show them how to cook them at home. One reason people don't like vegetables is because they try to cook them at home and wind up disappointed with the results. You can't just throw them on a grill and walk away. You have to do more than vegetables don't come with fat. They don't come with lots of different kinds of texture. They do take a little bit more work, but effort is worth it. And if we can find ways to show people that vegetables are fun and delicious and craveable, they will eat them. This moment, I feel like I'm like the national spokesperson for vegetables here, but I really believe this. This moment presents a unique opportunity for vegetables with supply chain issues, making food, especially meat, more expensive, with global warming on the front pages every day, with everyone knowing that they should be eating more healthy food. We are at a unique moment to show people that vegetables can be so much more. Thank you. Nina? Hello, everyone. Thank you, Andrew, and everybody that put this together. I'm super excited to be here. I'm quite passionate. I'm almost trying to hold on to my seat, listening to Amanda speak and everyone else, because, you know, I've been on this trend. Plant-based food has been a trend. It's a trend now. I've been trending for over 20 years. And I came into veganism. Yes, veganism. I'm not afraid of the V word. Uh, 20 years ago, I was natural bodybuilding competitively and one day woke up literally and my body just did not want any form of animal protein, flesh secretions, all the things that go along with it that as a bodybuilder, I knew I needed to build muscle. So I did the deep dive. I grew up with a catering father, a uh, chef. I swore I'd never be a chef at eight years old, never say never. He's still the chef he is. Uh, not vegan, but he still uh, now loves the food I make. So we know that plant-based food is a trend and it's going beyond just meat and dairy and natural foods. Now you're finding condiments, you're finding sugar. No, sugar isn't naturally vegan by the processing of it. You're finding vegan wines. No, wine isn't naturally vegan by the processing of it. So there's this new movement to really push forward all this plant-based goodness in every avenue of the culinary scene that we dance in as culinarians. Food, let's normalize plant-based food. It is food. It is food. It's another cuisine, if you will. I grab certain ingredients that don't include many of the ingredients I was taught in school about, but it's still an orange is an orange, an apple is an apple. So when marketers want to market it as all of a sudden something that's always been vegan is now vegan or plant-based, we kind of have to step back and look at that and, and ask ourselves, what message are we trying to put out there? Yes, my motto is I cook food to live for, not to die for, because the arena that I dance in that tends to be a health environment, corporate healthcare, people will say, oh, I die for that. But why aren't we living for food? Why aren't we eating foods that give us life? And I believe that it's international. Every country I've traveled to has plant-based food. That's Senegal, that's South America, that's China, Shanghai. I can find plant-based food everywhere I go. And people are quite inquisitive when I do ask for things to be left off my plate. And I find the chefs get very intrigued 
I'm very excited about it. If I had a dollar for every time someone said to me, something I make doesn't taste vegan, I'd probably be on an island right now sipping on a non-alcoholic, just my preference, uh, mojito. But you know, it's it's exciting to me to see that there's so much passion and demand from the consumer because that will move the needle for us as culinarians. But what I wanna say is it is profitable. We may have to look at the numbers. If we're doing scratch as I do in my kitchen, there's more labor costs, but you also save because we can repurpose so much. When I have jalapenos left over, I cut them, put them in a dehydrator and make this beautiful jalapeno powder, which I've yet, I just put it out there, but I've yet to see sold on the shelf like so many of our other seasonings. What are our seasonings? Plant-based. So if you say, oh, I can't do plant-based, you're doing it every day with your seasonings. You're making some other form of ingredient that you make taste better with plant-based ingredients. Let that be known. So let's normalize plant-based food as food. Let's, uh, my dad would say, I don't care about all the health benefits, Nina. It better be delicious. So every time I'm making something, I know the benchmark is delicious. Why would we want to serve anything less? But there are so many exciting things that we can do with plants. Plants, their eyes get brighter when they see vibrant colors. They've done studies. Kids will grab, gravitate to red strawberries and green apples before they will some bland artificial food that's come out of a box. So innately, we want these foods, but as it's been said, they need to be delicious. There shouldn't be, we don't use the V word in the cafe. And I work in a corporate environment that's healthcare that is serving food to live for and moving that out. We um, work with the blue zones, with the, the longest lived people. What were they eating? Even though they wouldn't be defined as vegan, the majority on their plate were plants, good plants. As my mother would say, good food. When I'd ask her what we were gonna eat, she'd say good food. I'd say, what kind of good food? She said, good food to eat. I'd say, what kind of good food to eat? She said, you better get out of my kitchen or you're gonna not have dinner tonight. So I think we have to just kind of simplify things and get excited about all the techniques we can apply to our vegetables that we've learned in culinary school, or if you came up in the restaurants and worked your way up, we have the techniques to apply it, but we have to get excited about it. I can't tell you the number of times for years that I would go and I'd say, do you have anything vegan? And I'd get steamed vegetables, come on. We're way past that, but it doesn't have to be so extreme that we can't get things done and it's not cost efficient. Plant-based is sustainable. We know that already, but it's sustainable for our kitchens and we can do inventory to show more sustainability, more profitability because the bottom line is what matters. I have an MBA with a finance and marketing intensive. So I understand we have to be financially sound. We need to be sustainable and then meet the demands. Plant-based is inclusive because you can already take whatever your menu is, whether it's Italian, whether it's Mexican, whatever it is, and create delicious, satiating dishes with the things you have already in your walk-in and your pantry, most likely. I'll challenge you and create beautiful dishes that you're already trusting customers will really love, but they'll also love that one vegan friend they have. That one vegan friend who they are always trying to figure out, where are we gonna take them to eat? Now they can bring them to your restaurant. They already trust you. And they can now feel very good about being able to sit down, be inclusive with their friend, show them this beautiful food that you're creating. It's not this learning curve so much that we have to learn. We just have to think about it. And that's what I do with people. I work with entities to help them put more plant forward food on their menu. And they're usually so surprised that they have more things that they ever thought they did. In closing, for me, plant base is here to stay. I'm not going anywhere. On my watch, I will continue until my last breath because I am that passionate about it. I know how it one makes me feel. I'm a hundred 
and you can guess how old you think I look, but um, I'm here to stay. I'm thankful for this opportunity and I look forward to supporting everyone that wants to get on this train because it's not stopping. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Uh, and now uh, our next speaker, Hannah Lopez. Hannah, take it away. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Nina, Amanda, you guys are just an inspiration. I am so fired up right now. Um, welcome to the first of many online events and webinars about plant-based foods on today's food service menu. My name is Hannah Lopez, for those that came on a little later. I'm the food service director on the marketplace development team here at the Plant-Based Foods Association. On behalf of PBFA, we look forward to working with all of you to meet the goals of the White House Conference ending hunger and reducing diet related disease. Today's event is the first step and we're thrilled to have you here with us. With personal health and nutrition being a key motivator for today's consumer, food service has truly become a catalyst for introducing innovative plant-based menu items. Our member companies have been trailblazers in the vast industry of retail and e-commerce. And as consumer demand continues to grow and plant-based food companies are leaning into more whole food, healthy ingredients, Food service is quickly becoming a large opportunity for growth and awareness across the industry. You're all the gatekeepers to showcasing how delicious and nutritious plant-based foods are and have the, have the ability to really meet the consumer where they are today, inspiring them to include these meals in their daily lives and routines. Many of the ways that PBFA supports our members and affiliates is through market research, menu trend analysis, and consumer data. Recognizing that these studies help guide key decision makers across the marketplace and inspire menu offerings. In fact, we actually just finished up our trend menu, uh, our menu trend report for 2022. We pulled data from over 4,500 restaurants across the country, and it covers the status quo of where plant-based foods are today in the world of food service. So just to give you guys a little bit of a teaser, I'm going to share with you some of the most recent statistics that we have. These are only a few. We will be launching our state of the menu uh, industry report in the next couple of weeks for all of our affiliates and members. But for those of that are here today, can you guys see that okay? Give me a thumbs up. Good, great. So what's currently trending? The highest penetrated dishes at restaurants that feature plant-based ingredients tend to be the staple entrees and appetizers like burgers and salads. While the four-year growth trend actually showcases a rise in popularity for tacos, bowls, mac and cheese, and pasta. And I'll actually put this in the chat for everyone to have as well. Secondly, plant-based dairy alternatives are continuing to rise across all segments. And they're not only your add-in option at your local coffee shop, they are now becoming staple key ingredients used in the kitchen, including non-dairy ice cream, butter, cheeses, milk, et cetera. I love this chart because it actually breaks it down by industry segment. So you can see that QSR and fast casual are leading the pace over the last 10 years of utilizing these key staple ingredients within their recipes and uh, kitchens. Lastly, we are seeing um, that terms vegetarian, vegan, and plant-based have all been consistently growing in the US, but plant-based and dairy-free are leading the pack with about a 20% year-over-year growth. The intel and the relationships that we foster within the industry is what we wanna share with you all. PBFA is offering an opportunity to connect with our members who actually create these amazing plant-based foods and provide you with the data through a series of upcoming events and webinars. You can reach out to me and we can begin collaborating on your own efforts to bring plant-based foods to your menus. Thank you again for joining us today and truly inspiring us, Chef Simern, Cohen and Curtis, you are inspiring this global vision of consumers' access to healthy choices. Thank you. And I'm gonna pass it over to Scott. Great, thank you. Thank you, chefs and, and, and Hannah, and thank all of you who are watching us. I know a lot of you are chefs and running and operating restaurants, and uh, some of you reached out ahead of time with questions, but if you have a question for our experts, there's a little Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. So feel free to put um, a question there. But I know one question that I got for our chefs is, 
if I was, uh, if I'm not already offering a plant-based or vegetarian option, what are, what are some of the first steps I should be thinking about? How do I, what are some changes I might need to make in my kitchen and my restaurant to begin to make plant-based or vegetarian option, an option available on my menu? How, how would you advise someone who's just starting to think about this? Uh, uh, Chef Cohen, you want to start us off? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> honestly, and this seems so simple, is think about food that you think is delicious and just make that vegetarian. If you love, I, you know, whatever whatever your restaurant is or, yeah, I mean, there's so many like recipes online and there's so many guides on how to veganize things, but just think of a dish that you think is delicious that you want to put on your menu, be it meat-based or vegetarian-based and just recreate that uh with vegetables or even tofu or plant-based meat. Uh, there are so many recipes and sites out there to help you, but it's all about what tastes good. Chef Curtis, did you wanna throw in on that? Sure, I agree with Chef Amanda. You know, I always start with people when they wanna transition the consumer right into what do they like, what's already in their pantry, because they don't have to go out and ex spend any money on something they don't know that's if it's gonna work. So I say that also for those that I work with in the restaurant industry, culinarians, what's already on your menu, as Chef Cohen said, and what is your theme? What is your niche? And go from there. So we you know, distill down something that could be easily deconstructed maybe into plant-based that they already have on the menu. So people are familiar with it and they already have that usually in stock. It's just a removing of some ingredients versus having to order new ingredients that maybe they don't want to buy a case of something, et cetera. So it makes it very easy to start where you're at and then realize that you may have customers that get really excited about this new dish that they wouldn't have thought of. And it's not such a distraction or a distance from what you're already doing. And you can measure it from there and then grow from there. Thank you. And what are one of the questions we got is what are some of the what are some of the questions you get about plant based or vegetarian? What are some of the common things consumers are asking? Uh, you know, I mean, I'm sure you're getting questions all the time, not just in your restaurant, but other places. And, uh, and I think in particular mis misunderstandings. What are some of the ways that you might address some of the misunderstandings about plant based and vegetarian options? I'll start, uh, Nina. I think people are confused with the terms. What's the difference mm -hmm. in plant-based versus vegetarian versus vegan? So depending on you know, what a restaurant really is, whether they're plant-based, that may still include fish sauce. So for me that abstains from that, I have to be a little bit more careful when someone says, oh, we're plant-based, that doesn't mean everything from the V to the V to the P. Right, so I think consumers, and again, I would say the industry probably has done a bit of that, and that is confusing. I find that because more people are looking for gluten-free item, that has, in my experience, surpassed even if it's vegan, because is that gluten-free? They want everything gluten-free. And now more people are aware of allergies or at least intolerances, and when we look at those, that's going to be your shellfish, that's going to be your eggs, that's going to be your dairy, and you know, a couple of tree nuts and, and things like that. So as we offer more of these plant-based offerings while nuts and seeds are in that, and we have to be mindful, but I think we already can lean into, it's not so much that someone's vegan or vegetarian but they have an intolerance that they're trying to deal with. And usually under plant-based, you kind of can cover that or have a layering of options. But gluten-free right now to me is one thing we get all the time and someone may not even have celiac and they've just heard it from the marketing. Chef Cohen or, or Chef Zimmern, do you wanna, you wanna answer sort of base, what, what are some of the common misperceptions, questions, that you get and how do you answer them? Well, I, I, I think Nina hit the, the 
the nail on the head. I, I do think that what we've seen, and I think it was illustrated in, uh, I think it was Hannah's third slide, is that the growth has become so explosive and the largest area of growth, if I'm remembering, was that orange line in the quick serve or the fast casual space, which is the, the, the space that most, the greatest number of people in the country have exposure to, right? I mean, if you go all the way up into fine dining, that's the, the least number of people participate in it. So whenever I see a graph like that, it immediately tells me we have an education problem. I could have guessed this question, you know, even if I was from planet Mars. So I think we need to do a really good job as an industry as it, at defining our terms. And it will, it will settle in. Five years from now, this won't even be, I'm hoping it's no longer uh, an issue. I also think that part of this is participation in organizations uh, like uh, the ones that Han like the ones that Hannah represents, um, uh, associations of like-minded people who share information strategies, etc. Uh, I, I think the most powerful words in the English language are "I don't know." Can you help me? And there are so many people available uh, to doing that. And, you know, no one it, people think they have to know everything. I knew nothing uh, about this uh, 10 years ago. I chose to be ignorant uh, about it. Um, and, you know, Nina mentioned Blue Zones. Dan Butner is one of my best friends. Uh, we live right near each other in Minnesota. I've known him for 30 years. Um, and, you know, we go to each other's houses and eat dinner. And I'm still ignorant about these things. But I made it my business to find out. Um, one of my restaurants is a hamburger and hot dog restaurant uh, down in Atlanta. Uh, and we actually put Amanda's suggestion into practice. Um, one of my favorite things to eat in the whole world is falafel. Um, so instead of, you know, one of my partners said, well, let's do a, a something that, you know, beyond or impossible or one of these things. And I was like, no, 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 no. I, I personally don't like that. Um, but I love so many different vegetable uh, preparation. One of my favorites that can be made into a disc is falafel. But then we put our homemade eggplant pickles, homemade oven dried tomatoes, homemade pickled onions, homemade dairy free tzatziki. And we began to experiment with this and we created something that's now one of our biggest runaway sellers. Uh, again, reinforcing Hannah's slide. Um, so I, 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 I think the experts are, are right as the, as the ignorant newcomer here, I've put all of those into play and they've all worked. One of the questions we've gotten from a manufacturer who's watching is, what's the best way to approach one of you, a chef or a restaurant, about a new product that you may not be familiar with? And I'm sure manufacturers aren't shy about reaching out to you, but what, what's the best way to do that? I'll take this one. I get it all the time. I have tried every <laughs> big meat out there. Oh, I love it. So just email me, info at dirtcandynyc.com and uh, tell me you want to send me some samples. And like, it's our favorite thing to do in the kitchen. We love trying new things. That's great. Um, <laughs> often another question we got in the chat is around our, our uh, artisanal cheeses as a great plant-based option. And how do we get the message to, that, to chefs and others and restaurant owners that there are a lot of amazing options out there that they've never thought of? I'm betting folks, some of you have thought a lot about artisanal cheeses, but maybe not. Or is that, Andrew, take it away. Well, I, as, as someone who has disliked every plant-based cheese uh, that he's ever tried, um, I, <laughs> I started finding that the industry uh, took huge leaps and bounds over the last year or two uh, with some in really incredible new uh, new developments. I think tech has been a phenomenal uh, asset to people who are trying. You, you no longer have to have uh, some sort of weird cashew butter that was pressed into a mold. And I'm, I'm not trying to make cashew butter, which I happen to love, sound uh, uh, disappointing. But then when I'm told it's cheese, and I'm just like, this is just cashew butter. Um, it, it was a little difficult for me to understand, and I'm cranky uh, and, uh, and curmudgeonly. Um, but at the National Restaurant Association, you know, uh, they, they host uh, a national show in Chicago and regional shows, and there's other, you know, the fancy food shows and stuff like that. 
Um, and so, yes, you can mail all kinds of things to info at dirtcandy.com, uh, as Amanda said. But I think one of the things that uh, people can do is go where there's the greatest concentration of buyers. And I have seen incredible opportunities within uh, the, the uh, you know, um, non-dairy cheese movement. Uh, magazine editors are great people to approach. And, and any industry show that you can, believe it or not, I mean, that's where I get exposed to so many things and you, you got to force yourself to try stuff. You try something, you, you, you're, you're, figuratively, your, your hair gets blown off. Um, it's an incredible, incredible experience. And so I know what this person is talking about. I think you got to go where the customers are. What are... Um rather than me trying to make up questions since you, you've probably wrestled with this a thousand times, what are some other, if you were talking to a restaurant owner just over the Zoom as we are now, and what are some things that you'd want them, you wish you'd known when you got started doing this decades ago? What are some, some of the challenges you didn't anticipate? What are some of the sort of tricks of the trade that you'd wanna share with other chefs and restaurant owners who are, who are just listening now thinking, Maybe I should add a plant-based or vegetarian or vegan option to my menu. I'm not sure if my customers will like it. I don't know a lot about, we talked about, there might be more prep costs involved, labor costs involved because of prep time. What are some, what are some of the things you'd wish you'd known before you began your journey? Oh, Chef so Curtis, much. Wanna, or Chef Cohen, go ahead, take it away. I like that. So I need a whole opening of plant-based restaurant for dummies. Okay, <laughs> there's nothing I need. <laughs> um, I, I think one of the having had this restaurant for 14 years um, and really seeing the the change in how diners are, and you know, I used to get diners who would come in and not so much be like, "I've never had a vegetarian meal before." <laughs> I'd be like, "Really? You've never had cheese pizza?" And they'd be like, "Yeah," and I'd be like, "Right, so you have." But it's sort of how people are thinking about it now. And, and now very few people come to the restaurant and been like, oh, I've never eaten vegetarian food before. Um, so I don't think restaurateurs now have as much to worry about as maybe some of us uh, older folks who have been doing this for a long time. People really are more open to trying new things. Um, I would say that one of our biggest struggles has been sort of the hype that people have coming in and what if they think they're going to be satisfied or not. And so even though we're like, oh, you know, we have five or seven medium small dishes, you will be satisfied at the end. They still don't have that one big piece of meat that sort of feels very filling. And uh, one trick that we sort of embraced over the last couple of years is uh, kind of having a our final course is a, a big piece of the vegetable, be it like a huge piece of butternut squash or a big slice of eggplant or even a ubiquitous roasted cauliflower that you see everywhere. People like holding a fork and knife. Um, it feels mm -hmm. satisfying and it feels filling. And, and that's something that I did not realize at the beginning when I was you know, making teeny tiny fussy little plates. I mean, like, but you'll have 20 of these and they're all vegetables and you'll feel cold. Chef Curtis, any things you wish you'd known when you started your journey that you'd like to share with other restaurant owners and chefs? Sure. The majority of my um, eaters or those who I have served throughout my career have not been vegan or plant-based. I've been in operations where they were coming to me, a luxury boot camp that was all vegan, and they were coming for whether it's health reasons or just to take a break from the lifestyle that they had and the rich foods. So being that I've served people that weren't actually vegan, um, I, I learned just to use familiarity. So when they came in on a Sunday, their first night in, I made a lasagna. And everyone could relate to that. So not trying to overthink it is what I'm saying. Not trying to go and get durian and want to wow them with something that smells like sweaty feet and you got to get past your nose to get to the pudding that's really delicious and you can't even carry it on a plane in China because it smells so bad. So I think <laughs> to simplify it and work where you're at, I've said this before and I'll repeat it because that's where I see the success. The other thing I found is that education of the consumer thinking, why am I spending this amount of food for uh, money for vegetables? And, and so I think we have to present it 
and and hold it to stand on its own as anything else on our menu. Because I have worked in restaurants that did have the meat and there wasn't the argument so much about what they were paying for that three ounce of steak. But when you came over here to this plant-based, even though it wasn't called vegan at the time, they were like, well, why am I paying for all this? It's just. So I think we have to look at the composition. We have to educate our team. Our team needs to get on board. It can be the first killer if you've got front of the house that isn't educated, how to speak, how to present, how to recommend, how to pair. If they've not had it and in every instance, I've trained my team, no matter how their plate looks when they leave the restaurant, how to speak about these things and how, how to feel good about it. So I guess I'm saying have that enthusiasm and that passion because we're the first one they see. And if we're not excited and it's something one of our team members is just doing because it's the job, I mean, that's like anything. You go to a restaurant and say, oh, what's really good on the menu? And you know, the person says, I don't know, I don't eat here. I mean, that's just a game killer no matter what you're serving, right? So I think all around it's education, it's really figuring out where you wanna dance, as I love to say, and you know, realizing every ingredient, our labor, we can't say, well, you're paying for this because of our labor, but we have to figure out how to really make it something that we're excited about. And I believe that enthusiasm carries out to the consumer and they look and want more. For more. Great. Can, can I put in a small Andrew, plug please. for other cultures? Uh, the, you know, we, we have, you know, we, we don't need to invent or reinvent, uh, you know, the, 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 the wheel here. Um, you know, I had the opportunity, uh, at one point when I was, uh, writing restaurant reviews for a glossy monthly 20 plus years ago. Uh, in Minnesota, and the the first uh, true uh, vegetarian Indian restaurant opened in an area of town where there was a conglomeration of Indian restaurants. And I, as any good restaurant columnist would, I took several groups of friends to eat there at different times of day. And all of them, there was always a group, one person in the group that, upon walking out, said to me, you know, the the old cliche. I didn't realize that there wasn't meat in this meal until I left uh, and you reminded me. And it, it stuck in my head. And I remember when I went to, you know, uh, the Desai countries for the first time. Um, and, you know, I know not everybody, you know, can travel, but these days you can, you can go on YouTube and you can watch, you know, chefs in every region in India cooking uh, in a style that may be unfamiliar to you, but contain flavors uh, and vegetables that are, and the same in Japan, and the same in other parts of the world where you can see and learn and be inspired by. It doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to lift that recipe, but something may click for you. Um, I'm blanking on the Japanese name for it, but you know, this time of year with these incredible uh, different pumpkins and squash in the market, um, I do uh, a Japanese dish that's essentially just, uh, you know, cubes of pumpkin and squash that have been uh, cooked in uh, mirin uh, and soy and, and some other goodies. And uh, it, it's a simmer dish. And you let the pumpkin just sit in that simmering liquid until it's room temperature and serve it. And it is, it is something that my friends literally inhale. They can't stop eating it. I have to make pounds and pounds and pounds of it when I, when I make it um, because they won't stop eating it because it's so savory. It's loaded with so much umami. Um, so our inspiration can come from very many places. It, it can almost happen in reverse. It's not what I wish I knew. It's what is yet, you know, it, it set yourself up for success, I guess. Hannah, you wanted to jump in here. I did. So as, as I'm not a chef, but I am inspired by what you're saying, um, Chef Zimmern and, and team, is listen and be inspired by your guest. So think about the last time you've actually asked your consumer, your customer, your guest, what are you looking for? What's exciting to you? What are you trying to do as more of a balance in your lifestyle every day? And then you can turn around as a food service operator and work with your broadline or your distributor or reach out to different associations that specialize in plant-based foods 
PBFA and um, really lean into to people that know better about it. Um, if your consumer is wanting a better plant-based burger or a, a chicken tender or something that is going to help them bridge to that place of being healthier, um, really that's how you're going to advocate for the broadliners to pick it up. So it really starts with you listening to the guest and that's just going to keep that consumer and that relationship closer to your daily operations versus just keeping your head within the four walls of the kitchen and just coming up with things on your own. So just wanted to add that um, little piece to this. We we did get a question from Jeremy in the in the Q and A button. Folks have questions, just hit the Q and A button. But about distributors and uh, are there distributors that you found are better than others when it comes to providing um, plant-based, vegetarian, vegan options and ingredients, chefs, what, what do you think about that? This is Nina sounds like on Amanda, the West Coast. Amanda, you're buying stuff off the back of a truck. So maybe just that's not the right question for you, but Nina, please take it away. Uh, on the West Coast, I've seen in the past few years, a huge increase of distributors bringing on plant-based items. And I can say that experience-wise asking for things and them just not really being interested to even investigate it. And I found mm -hmm. in, in Northern California, an actual distributor vegan distribution, and it's that's their name, but they have plant-based foods and that's all they specialize in. But since that time of working now with them for over four years in the past two years, it has been leaps and bounds. It was like, is someone just listening to my conversation in the office of things I wish, you know, the dis other distributors that I need to work with because of our size of operation. So I think, um, again, as Hannah said, listen to the customer. Well, then the distributors are beginning to listen to us as their customers. And if we're telling our distributors that our customers are requesting and demanding these things, it's starting to seep in. And maybe it's not across the board. Maybe first they're going to dairy or alternative meat items, but I've seen a huge increase with all the distributors that I work with. And it's been me having conversations, but now I see it in the past two years. That's great. Um, we have one more question. And I think I think you're gonna say, um, we should have Meatless every day, not Meatless Monday. But um, we have someone watching from Meatless Monday, which has started, which was started, oh, wow, almost 20 years ago and found that's an effective way to introduce people to plant-based foods. Just uh, Sherry's curious and hearing what you think about that, Meat, sort of featuring Meatless Monday and restaurants, whether that might be a way to introduce folks to plant-based vegetarian vegan options, or is it always Meatless Monday? I think it was great 20 years ago, but I do think it should be every day. Uh, want to eat healthy it should or vegetarian it shouldn't just be on monday it shouldn't be regulated to one day since most people go out on uh fridays and saturdays i, I think it was a such an amazing thing and, and it really did uh change how restaurants uh sort of thought about vegetarian meals but nowadays every day should be one and I, I think one of the best things you can do is have more than one option on the menu because when you only have one option people get bored of it or they're like well are I going to have the steak or am I going to have the eggplant? But if they're like, oh, I have the eggplant or the sauce, there's a lot more choice there. I agree. I think there's a lot more room than just meatless Mondays. Uh, I've tagged Fridays with something. I mean, there's more than Taco Tuesday. Come on. And, <laughs> and you can jump on Taco Tuesday and have meatless Taco Tuesday. So I think there's a lot of room for creativity, but I think as a foundation, it set a precedence that we can continue to work with. And depending on your restaurant and what you do and how you do, and if you have specials of the week, if you have happy hour, there are many things you can introduce your customers, right. clients to. That's a great idea. Um, we have just a few minutes left. Andrew, any, any parting words of inspiration for our folks who are watching? Well, I I think our, our world is facing uh, an existential uh, crisis of uh, that, unlike anything we've ever seen before across seven or eight different uh, pillars. Um, it's, it's not just our food system uh, that is, you know, has been shown to be wobbly. 
and inconsistent and uh and and geared towards the the happiness and the few instead of uh the supply and wellness of the many and i believe very strongly that one of our ways out of this bitter morass that we have found ourselves in uh is through food and when you come down to food it is eating more sustainably and with more equity and uh and social justice in mind. And then when you drill down on that further, the biggest answer that, that pops up to me is uh, eating uh, foods that are grown in soil. Uh, I think that it is a uh, incredible, incredible world. Once you start lifting uh, it up by the corner of the tarp and looking under what it would do for the farm in America, the family farm, the way it would restore uh, balance in terms of a broken immigration system when it comes to, you know, food RX uh, that Laura mentioned from the White House at the beginning of her talk. Um, the answer is plant-based foods. Uh, and we don't need to put rules around it. I mean, I still eat, you know, meat and plenty of it. I don't eat durian, Nina. Stay in your lane. I'm the, I'm the, <laughs> famous durian hater in the panel. Um, but it is it is really, really important that we focus on, on this segment of our food system above all others, because when we do that, the rest of it tends to right size itself and it tends to solve problems uh, um, by uh, amplifying uh, without even uh, heavy intentionality. Um, going back to something that Nina mentioned a while ago about my friend Dan's book, The Blue Zones, we can learn so much from indigenous peoples, first peoples all around the world, other cultures that are older than ours. Remember, ours is not that old when we think of uh, traditional America, but I would remind people there were people living here for thousands of years before a white European uh, set foot on this soil, and we would do well uh, to uh, learn from our uh, Native American brothers and sisters as well. Um, we have developed a, a very, very shaky, rickety system here in this country predicated on convenience and speed. Um, and uh, then what hasn't been predicated on convenience and speed has been uh, left up to be the purview of those who are wealthy and can afford to do something. And I think we need to take the opposite approach. I'm thrilled uh, at the contributions of all the people, not only on this panel, not only Scott, your entire team, all the associations that we listed at the top who are part of this fight with us, and everybody who is listening in either live or taped. Uh, it is an incredible movement, and I'm just thrilled to be a very, very, very small part of it. Great. Well, that'll have to be the last word. Thank you, chefs and Hannah so much for joining us. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.